skydiving. A leap from two miles up, a descent at 120 miles an hour. This is routine for members of the United States Army Parachute Team, champions in competition and combat. In this issue of The Big Picture, Army skydivers demonstrate their skill in parachute techniques. Man and sky maneuvers which have military significance for the Army's airborne striking power. I'm Captain James M. Perry, the commanding officer of the U.S. Army Parachute Team. We're a comparatively new and small unit, but you'll be hearing a great deal about us from now on. As an agency of the Continental Army Command, we represent the Army in sports parachute competition. In the international field, members of the Army Parachute Team have captured numerous trophies many held previously by Iron Curtain countries. Additionally, every year we stage hundreds of demonstrations from coast to coast in the sport known as skydiving. We also give instruction to military teams of allied nations in delayed jump techniques. In addition, the Army Parachute Team is responsible for continuous research and development in the tactical applications of this particular skill. Before we take you into this exhilarating world of the Army skydiver, let's look at some of the early history of parachuting. Here's a model based on the first known design, sketched by Leonardo da Vinci in the 15th century. It never was tested. The first successful parachute drop came 300 years after Leonardo's design. A French balloonist named André Jacques Garnerin jumped from 2,000 feet over Paris, descending safely as shown in the drawing of this event. Mr. Benjamin Franklin, who was then our ambassador to France, witnessed Mr. Garnerin's experiment. Inspired by the feat, Franklin wrote a report suggesting that the United States create a core of 5,000 parachute balloons, each one of them capable of carrying two soldiers to be dropped in combat behind the enemy lines. And so the idea for airborne infantry originated with an American. Now let's see how this inspiration led to our paratroop force of today and to the establishment of the United States Army Parachute Team. As late as World War I, airmen scorned the parachute, regarding it as a champion swimmer might look at water wings. In the decade that followed, American parachuting remained in the carnival stunt category. In the early 1930s, the Soviets began experimenting with the parachute for military use. They worked out early methods for dropping infantry, cargo, and weapons. They even tried dropping manned vehicles without benefit of a parachute. But it was the Nazi blitzkrieg thrusts at the outset of World War II that demonstrated the effectiveness of airborne assaults. German paratroop successes in the Netherlands and the island of Crete clearly established the value of this swift striking force. America's paratroop training program went into high gear on the eve of U.S. participation in World War II. Hardened by rigorous tests of stamina and endurance, men of this elite infantry force took to the skies in a new and dramatic concept of battle. <laughs> 
Airborne training continued as the war progressed. Units assigned to England perfected jump techniques in daily practice. It was a world of nylon and ripcord, and men who challenged the geometrics of space, a challenge to be pursued with incredible success in the years ahead. Airborne units on D-Day of the greatest military invasion ever mounted took off across the channel for an onslaught against the enemy from the sky. These were pioneers in harness and chute and helmet, products of airborne schools who knew what was expected of them and were ready to do the job. Tough, capable, confident. Drilled in the ritual of the jump, the sky soldier in World War II became a legend. In the air over Normandy, they measured their landing time in minus hours and minutes as they jumped in advance of the first wave of assault troops to hit the beaches. Paratroopers dropped over strategic enemy held positions. Soon the Nazis were forced to swallow their own bitter medicine. Following World War II, the Army continued to improve parachute techniques. New training methods and equipment were put into use at Fort Benning, Georgia. By the time U.S. forces were committed to combat in Korea, techniques for air delivery of material to the front lines were developed to almost an exact science. Special parachutes, some big enough to drape a house, had come into use. Some were capable of safely lowering jeeps, artillery, and light armor. Combat jumps and cargo drops were a potent force in helping to drive the communists out of South Korea. In the decade following the Korean War, Training of American airborne troops was intensified in keeping with modern military concepts, emphasizing special skills by quick, hard-hitting forces. Training operations for airborne troops were stepped up in all parts of the world. The frozen tundra of Alaska presented new challenges for the paratroops. Greenland's ice cap offered similar climate, but different problems of terrain. Operation Firmlink in Thailand gave the airborne experience in another kind of climate. This demonstration for a friendly people also showed one of those rare occasions when a paratrooper's best friend is his reserve chute. This man used his when the main chute failed to open properly. With NATO forces in Germany, American airborne units practiced assault resupply techniques, not only to keep in fighting trim in the face of global communist designs, but also supporting and strengthening the forces of our friends and allies. In addition to the basic task of dropping men and material into combat situations, new jobs were found for the Army's nylon umbrella. Here at Fort Bliss in Texas, a radio-controlled midget plane equipped with a small parachute acts as a target for anti-aircraft fire. When a hit is scored, the chute automatically pops out to lower the drone. The Army's photo reconnaissance drone operates in similar fashion. Controlled from the ground, it can fly over enemy terrain, taking such detailed motion pictures as these for use by field commanders, and then return to base, using its recovery parachute to bring it and its camera down gently.
When the Army Ballistic Missile Agency needed nose cones that would survive re-entry into the atmosphere, scientists called on the parachute to help in research. Fired far out to sea, the nose cones were packed with chutes that opened automatically, making it possible to recover them for examination. Development of new parachute techniques is constantly underway at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, training center for the Airborne and headquarters of the United States Army Parachute Team, one of the Army's most unique research organizations. The parachute team has as a major assignment the development and testing of specialized parachute techniques and devices for airborne operations, such as the Hermione parachute. This experimental chute, which may be towed by a ground vehicle, has no ripcord and is useful as a jump training device. But these men of the U.S. Army parachute team, gathered at Fort Bragg for a briefing session, are recognized throughout the world primarily for their accomplishments as skydivers, a specialized aerial skill that demands the highest degree of perfection in controlled freefall and parachute techniques. Each man is a qualified rigger, packs his own chute, and sees that it is in perfect working condition. All chutes are logged and signed for according to strict safety regulations. Aerial maneuvers by skydivers require every possible safety precaution. Parachutes for the Army team are specially designed with scientifically engineered steering vents to control the flow of air through the chute canopy. A reserve chute, pre-packed by another qualified rigger, is worn by every skydiver. Smoke grenades attached to his shoes mark his descent in demonstration skydiving. An altimeter will tell the skydiver at what altitude in his fall he must open his parachute. A stopwatch allows him to time his aerial maneuvers with split-second accuracy. Weather is an important factor in skydiving. Wind, visibility, and other climatic conditions must be considered before operations are scheduled. The jumpers, according to their experience, may operate in various wind velocities. Each member of the 20-man Army parachute team has made over 350 jumps, but nothing is taken for granted. Equipment is constantly checked and rechecked. Last-minute instructions from their commander before takeoff. For extended freefall maneuvers, the skydivers must go above the 10,000 foot level. The higher the altitude, the more time for maneuvers on the way down. Freefall in skydiving involves a considerable time lapse before the jumper opens his parachute. Using only his body to control his movements, this member of the U.S. Army parachute team is performing basic freefall maneuvers. A highly developed skill of Army skydivers is formation flying. Precise manipulation of their bodies while in free fall allows the men to perform various movements in unison. 
As many as six men have been used in similar maneuvers, illustrating superb mastery of airspace. Experiments in coordination during freefall, such as the firing of a signal pistol, emphasize the skydiver's complete control. Here is another member of the parachute team with some improvised freefall maneuvers. The slightest motion of his body controls the direction of his movement through the air. At all times, the skydiver must be able to stabilize himself in flight. The smoke grenades are important in tracking rate of fall and wind drift for the tactical military situations involving the paratrooper. A vertical descent at 120 miles an hour might carry the jumper horizontally as fast as 60 miles an hour. Parachutes must be opened at a minimum of 2,200 feet from the ground and all free fall maneuvers must be completed before descent to that altitude. Being able to maneuver and stay together in the air allows the sky soldiers to track as a group and land in the same area for assembly and deployment. Formation of sports parachuting clubs has been encouraged by the Army in an effort to further knowledge of airborne skills. These clubs at military installations throughout the nation provide a pool of expert jumpers from which the U.S. Army parachute team has drawn many of its members. Audiences in the United States from coast to coast have witnessed many breathtaking demonstrations by the elite U.S. Army parachute team. These goodwill ambassadors, in addition to demonstrating their airborne skills for the nation, also represent the United States in skydiving competition abroad. For public demonstration style jumping, skydivers go aloft to an altitude of about 7,000 feet. On the ground, signal panels are used to flash the jumper's instructions on the specific maneuvers they are to execute. First man out is directed to perform a right series. And here he goes, right turn, left turn, back loop, right turn again, another left turn, and another back loop. By pulling on the toggle lines to control the flow of air through his parachute canopy, the jumper can point himself in any direction. Another right series for the next jumper. The direction signal must be spotted from the air by the jumper within a period of 30 seconds.
To the jumper poised on the edge of space, the free fall presents a thrilling challenge. This is how the ground looks to him as he goes through free fall maneuvers. A spinning world that seems to defy the law of gravity and gives the diver a tremendous sense of freedom. It was thought at one time that the severe pressure of free fall would cause a man to lose consciousness and black out. Now it has been proven that a jumper in free fall can work arithmetic problems or perform any other mental functions. The skydiver uses his arms like the wings of an airplane. The flow of air around his body turns it according to the way he moves his hands and feet. Extreme dexterity and top muscular coordination are musts for every team member. The activities of these men contribute ultimately to the skill of our airborne soldier. How much equipment can a man carry in free fall? What color canopy is most difficult to detect at night? These and similar questions are probed by the parachute team. Vital data accumulated by men who have learned the complex art of maneuvering in the air, making available a fund of technical knowledge invaluable to the Army's airborne operations. Today, an entire division may go to battle through the sky. Men and material must be conveyed swiftly to the combat zone. To carry out this mission successfully, knowledge of airborne techniques and delivery methods is indispensable. has become a vital element in modern combat. It is a major factor in the planning of the United States Strategic Army Corps, which emphasizes the Airborne Division in its striking power. These armies of paratroopers and their equipment drop from the sky with skill and speed and safety born of endless research, a descent to battle made possible only through the mastery of men who have swept through the skies before and measured the immense difficulties of the task. One of the prime resources in our concept of mobility, airborne operations help provide the United States with a swift, hard-hitting force capable of reacting rapidly to any threat which may face this nation anywhere in the world. Giving major support to this effort, the United States Army Parachute Team plays a significant role in its contribution to airborne skills. While the trooper units maintain battle readiness, the research team continues to test tactical aerial maneuvers. has always envied the birds and dreamed of imitating their flight. Today's Army skydivers bring to fruition this age-old dream.
The experience of the sky jump is a triumph of man over nature, and those who engage in this activity are partners in a unique fellowship. Like all paratroopers, members of the U.S. Army parachute team share a common spirit of high accomplishment. It is a fraternity of nerve and skill, which fulfills with dedication its public as well as its military objectives. Today, Benjamin Franklin's vision of a peerless airborne force to protect our nation has been realized. But the search for even greater mastery over the dynamics of space goes on. In this quest, which may ultimately affect the destiny of our nation, these men render a distinguished service.